Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 2, Episode 10. With myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson back. Hey. Um, so as ever, guys, please leave a like if you like what we do. Leave a comment on anything that we've discussed today. And also, please subscribe for more Trash Arts content. And on this week's show, guys, we've got Sam bringing us up to speed with everything industry. And um, then Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing the Scream, Scream, Scream. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling with Just that Just keep one, that in. <laughs> <laughs> Sam had the pleasure of interviewing the Scream Queen, uh, Christine Santiago, which I think is a cracking name. And um, then we're going to be discussing cop films. So uh, without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. So Seth Rogen is looking to produce a horror film with Joe Levine. Joe Levine's guy did Fifty Fifty. Do you remember that film? With Seth Rogen and uh, Joe Scorn Levitt. I've never seen it, but I do know of it. Lovely film. And yes, yeah, I, I literally saw this today and I was like, oh, I've got to mention that, that sounds amazing. But it's about a cursed VHS that pulls teenagers into an 80s slasher. Which is a cool idea, and it's, it's, it's quite a hot script at the moment. It sounds a little bit like um, The Final Girl, but with the VHS twist. It's called Video Nasty which I'm not keen on that title because that title has a significant meaning in this country. But fair enough, it's a cool title. Mads Mikkelsen is to replace Johnny Depp in the Fantastic Beasts 3. Now, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I hate Harry Potter. I hate everything about it. I think it's ridiculous. I was Lord of the Rings boy back in the day. How dare you, Sam, <laughs> how dare you. <laughs> but I absolutely love Mads Mikkelsen. He's an amazing actor. I recently uh, finished Hannibal. I totally understand why they want him for this particular character. Um, <clears throat> the film is looking to come out in 2022. Personally, again, too many Harry Potter films. If he does it, he'd be signed for five, I think. Because you can't have enough Harry Potter films. That feels like a waste of Mads Mikkelsen to be there. I was excited when I first heard that Mads Mikkelsen was going to be acting in that because he's a great actor. But five of them, really... Yeah, really, you should be doing Hannibal season four. But, I think yeah. it's Warner Brothers <laughs> cash cow. It is, it is, and they're going to keep doing it when they've got theme parks. Oh. And despite J.K. Rowling's transgender problems, they'll keep making money out of her. She's irrelevant to it at this point, if anything. Yeah. Another random one: The Rock is to reboot the Scorpion King. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what, in 2020 we needed Scorpion King back, but... Would he be acting in it again, or just... No. No, okay. It's actually quite a, a touching story, because the first film he ever did, his first acting role, was The Scorpion King. Yeah. So for him, he's always got this, like, nostalgia towards it. What? Was it not The Mummy 2? And then they yeah, did The Yeah, Mummy Scorpion. Returns, yeah. That's the thing, I think it's more like, it's just something that he looks back fondly on. And it did actually make about four films. Wrestlers took over The Rock's role, I think, from the second, third, and fourth. So there's clearly an audience for it somewhere. I always, I never watched Scorpion King. I liked the Mummy films when I was younger, but Scorpion King always felt a bit like, really? Let's just say it came out at the height of the CGI boom. Oh, God. It's one of the um, worst CGI's ever, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal is going to be working with directors that I thought I'd never see him work for in a million years. Michael Bay. They're going to make, yeah, they're going to make a film called Ambulance. And, um, What's that about? <laughs> no one knows. It's, all they know is the title and it's a Michael Bay film. So it's going to be, you know, explosions. Exploding ambulances. <laughs> slow motion. All the typical crap that Michael Bay loves. Jay Gyllenhaal is like, weirdly, one of the most busiest actors in the world right now. He signed up for that TV show about The Godfather, for the making of The Godfather. He's just completed that film with Antoine Foucault, uh, the remake of um, The Guilt. And he's got plenty of film signs with Netflix. And he even announced that he's going to do a TV show with the director of Dune and uh, Blade Runner 2049. Not going to try and pronounce his name, but he's a genius. Just not going to try and pronounce his name. On a more localised level, we've just launched Indiegogo for our two films, Acting and Decline. This is essentially is for our festival run and for the general marketing, such as subtitles. If you want to help out this Indiegogo, please check out the link that hopefully is hovering above... Well, not above anything, but just on the screen in general. <laughs> <clears throat> There's some great perks as well, so go over and check it out. Yeah, and we've got some, um, we're, we're actually added some extra perks this week, including the opportunity, if you have children, for Annabella Rich, our actress, to be a Disney princess for them. You know, like personalised, nice little video like that, which uh, 
there's an audience for it, definitely, you know? I'm not sure it's a Disney princess. There might be problems with copyright. <laughs> um, a princess. <laughs> a princess. A princess. A vague princess yeah. of some kind. And if, <laughs> if by popular demand next week, we might actually have Sam doing it as well. <laughs> <laughs> princess videos. One thing I did want to say is that, a um, little, little spoiler for next week's podcast, we're actually on a film shoot from tomorrow, so we will be recording and giving you some behind the scenes of our new production. So, yeah, should be interesting. Cool. Thanks for that, Sam. So, like I said earlier, Sam had the pleasure of having an interview with the Scream Queen, Christine Santiago, which I said before, I love that name. Um, Christine's actually from New York, and uh, she's done a few different things, very talented. So, without further ado, over to you, Sam. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Christina Santiago. How are you doing? You good? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. It's been a productive day. Is it, uh, been, is it early for you or is it like mid? Because it's American time. It's five, five o'clock in the afternoon for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what got you interested in acting? What got me interested? Um, I've been a performer all of my life, basically. Since the second grade, I got like to sing in front of the entire school and all their families in second grade. And ever since then, I've just been chasing that high. And um, I did theater growing up um, and then got into film about 2012 because uh, it's either you get into film or you stay in theater. And theater, there wasn't really much left for me there. So uh, I've been doing this for forever, it seems like. <laughs> So um, what was your first film acting role? My first film acting was Dick Johnson in Tommy Gunn vs. Cannibal Cop. I played um, somebody named Molly, and uh, I was kidnapped by the Cannibal Cop. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a pretty uh, funny, gruesome movie, but uh, I end up being like a certain number victim for him because he has to like do a satanic ritual and kill like a, a hundred victims to uh, get his uh, diabolical plan going or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so are you more interested in doing um, horror films? Um, It's not that I'm more interested. It's just um, I, I see it's more of a, a project that everybody wants to do. And don't get me wrong, I love horror. Absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite genres, without a doubt. Um, I grew up watching like uh, Tales from the Dark Side, Tales from the Crypt, all that sort of stuff. All the old, crazy, like cheesy horror movies. I love those. Um, but I, I guess it's just a. I, I, I'm hoping I could be like Western New York scream queen, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't mind playing too much of um, the victim in horror films, because I know some actors are they personally from working with they're not always keen on playing victims whereas others are like yeah kill me as many times do you enjoy oh yeah i absolutely love being covered in blood i'm like (laughs) cover me completely all the way (laughs) it's uh i actually do like it i like um the thrill of like being scared and all that sort of stuff so um i and i think i play it really well too um, I told, I'm told like my facial expressions really show like I look legit scared sometimes and like I could cry and stuff. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm playing off of like fear and fear is like one of the scariest things I think you could have to feel. Mm, definitely. So yeah, I love it. Love being the victim. In that question, I'm just curious. Is it like, cause I, I know looking at your IMDb, you have played, you have been in a lot of horror films. Is there any particular, yes. uh, death that you enjoyed with the makeup perspective <laughs> let's see um i would have to say hmm it, it would have to be a tie right now i always thought like i i loved how i de- um um like holland road massacre i loved my death in that <laughs> it was uh very different i've never been asked hey do you want to die with an axe going into your lady parts? And I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. But uh, Casting Couch Slaughter has uh, also taken a, a hot spot seat for me in that uh, How I Died is uh, pretty cool in that in that one, too. Um, I, I don't want to like give away that one's ending because that's a very recent movie mm. that uh, just came out. But uh, definitely... 
check that out if you want to see horrific deaths. Horrific deaths is good on that one. Are there any uh, particular actors who've inspired you to want to get into performing? Ooh, I let's see. Um, hmm, that's a tough one. I I didn't really have like an idol growing up in that sort of sense of who I absolutely want to be like. Um, I mean, and even right now I'm trying to think of somebody, I guess I'd like to be funny, but I don't think I'm funny. (laughs) So like Ryan Reynolds is like one of my all time go-to favorite, like actors because he just can drop these one lines and have a straight face. But other than that, like I don't think I hone in on anything in particular. Um, because like growing up I also I also did theater so I I did get a likeness to Leah Michelle but that's because I can sing like her and we kind of look similar <laughs> but other than that uh I didn't have anybody who I completely idolized no nope. do you have a role so I like people though <laughs> <laughs> do you have a particular role which you would say was like your favorite at this point my favorite hmm no, no, I haven't found something where I was like, oh my God, this is utter like dream role for me. Just, yeah, I do know that um, for Holly Road Massacre, I did enjoy it a lot because I grew up in Angola, New York, and I've been to Pigman Road. It's a very, it's a, it's a legit road. It's a haunted road. I've scaled up and down it no problem and definitely gotten spooked so I like that in the sense of I it took me back to my childhood and being the the trying to find fears and haunted places but other than that no um I can't really say I have a dream role maybe if I could sing in that role maybe that that would be really cool again to be able to sing in a role again isn't there like um, characters, even ones, you know, that are in the iconography that we know, like comic book or horror characters have already played that you would absolutely love to take your own spin on? Oh my goodness. Let's see. Hmm. <laughs> that is such a great question. Um, <laughs> huh. Uh, let's see. I really like Tom Holland as Spider-Man and I've always like, I, I enjoy Tom Holland as a person. So he's, uh, he's pretty cool. If I could try and be Spider-Man for a hot second, that'd be awesome. I grew up in the three, the eras where there was three different Spider-Man. So that would be pretty cool. Like, just be like this dorky person, but deep down inside, you're like this awesome superhero. I think I, I think I'd like that. <laughs> like, you have no idea what I do for all you people, and you call me a loser. <laughs> So what's that? That would be cool. What's what's coming up for you in the future? Coming up for me in the future, I do have a whole bunch of projects coming up. Actually, uh, Veronica, we're filming right now, and it's a it's a psycho thriller. Um, has to do a lot with like dark stuff, like suicide, depression, um, drug abuse, uh, domestic violence. Um, that. That's we're currently filming that right now, and then we're also uh, working on uh, something uh, a, a TV series called Involving Karma. Um, I play so, um, Karma's best friend, and she goes through uh, the series of weird things that involve the seven deadly sins. Mm. Um, so that's going to be really, really cool. And then I have like, a whole bunch of other movies coming up in 2021 when we can start really like buckling down and filming without this uh the crazy uh pandemic world going on like a uh, callback and gym of the dead uh all really awesome movie ideas coming up yeah those are with um foxtrot productions which is it is it pete, Hob- uh, pete hodgkins from uh horror screen vaults involved Yes, yes. Peter is uh, like one of my bestest friends, I have to say. Oh. <laughs> um, I help him with the, the quiz on Haunted Hill. I, I help co-host with oh, him. Nice. And uh, he brought these ideas to Foxtrot Productions. And I cannot wait to see us like s- start filming and seeing the project come together. So that'll be really, really great. There's plenty of exciting projects coming up for you then. Yes, yes. 
I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could show you how excited I am. <laughs> so, like, uh, my last question for you, this has gone a lot quicker than most interviews, but that's never a problem, is uh, yeah. basically... Do you have a preference of what kind of horror? So, like, are you more of a horror comedy fan or are you more of a psychological? Is it all really down to the character? Ooh, that's tough. I think it just depends on, like, how I would feel for the, like, what I'm in the mood for. Um, if, if you're referring to, like, acting in it, I, I think I'm down for any sort of horror. It does not matter. It could be gory. It could be crazy, psycho thriller it could be serial killer chasing you in the dead of winter it could be cabin in the woods style where you choose your <laughs> the way you're gonna die kind of deal um i love i love it all the twists and turns the crazy people the whoa oh my goodness i didn't even think that this could be a thing and even aliens i really would love to do something with aliens <laughs> Uh, maybe someday I will. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. It sounds like things are going very well for you. And you've got a nice uh, future ahead as far as horror is concerned. Aww. Thank you. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> well, hopefully if you ever come down to the UK, I know it's not literally around the corner, it's a long way for you, but if you do, let us know and we'd love to put you in a film. Oh my gosh, please, I'd love that. Even if it's just to come watch you guys film, I'd be more than happy to, to join in on the fun. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll see where the future leads in that regards. Thank you so much for joining us, Christina Santiago. Um, is there anything you'd like to plug just before we finish off? Uh, go see Casting Couch Slaughter and... and Holland Road Massacre and every other movie that I'm in. It's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> you will laugh, you will cry, you'll be like, oh my goodness. There. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Cool. Thank you for that, Sam. Very good interview. Um, so, guys, this week we decided that we were going to talk about Everything cut film related, or as we call it in the UK, the police. Or pigs. Thanks for too far. Sounds Sounds like <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a few others. Filth, we can. You know. <laughs> We're crossing a line there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we kind of decided to break this down into three categories, really. So, the three categories basically are you've got your hero cop films, you've got your corruption and uh, corrupt cop films and then you've got your kind of comedy spoofy and um, jokey cop films and um, so guys first one hero cops you got any ideas you want to throw a name out See, my first thought when i think of uh, hero cops has to be uh, robocop because robocop he's literally built to be a hero and it's from if you think about the, the story of robocop he's a guy who gets like fucked up on the, in the line of duty and they rebuild him to be the perfect cop. And I think that's really interesting because obviously um, Robocop is a satire. Being that it is a satire, he's almost, he's literally his program to serve the law. And he kind of like detects what's right and what's right and what's right. Yet the, corp the corporation that built him is evil. And I think that's the interesting thing. And I mean, it comes down to the fundamentals of the, um, the whole system in place with cops that they are people who want, generally speaking, going in to serve the law, to abide and to help people. And in Robocop's sense is that, yes, they have built him to do that, but there are evil intentions behind it, which comes into the systematic problems we have with the police, is that there are already a lot of harshness with, um, already in there, which well, I think I, Robocop does a good job with. I think it's also, you know, a, a question in that of, of if he's programmed to serve the law and do exactly what the law says who's to say that the law is right or moral or good you know well, you how do you it. define these good guys by following a a, a a thing that's guided by something that's already fallible that's already uh, problematic i honestly think that's one of the bigger messages in robocop and obviously it's a film that came out in the 80s where, you know, things are a little bit dystopian, or starting to get a bit dystopian. So it, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a beautiful commentary on that. 
I think it's quite funny and slightly fundamentally flawed that the corporation that built him have like almost basically undid themselves because they made him so righteous and like rule to the law that it ends up bringing them down, does it not? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like. <laughs> It's that deep floor, and like Hero Cops is an interesting one. So if you look at um, Dirty Harry, Dirty Harry, he is a good cop. He's gonna do his job, get the bad guys, but he has all the attitude with it. You know, he has all the aggression, and Dirty Harry in particular, kind of like what we discussed with Westerns last week, being Clint Eastwood, it's all about masculinity. And weirdly, the whole concept of being a hero cop is tied to some sort of masculine strictness. I think it's strange one. It's because there's a whole sort of element of control in there, and mm. uh, poli like the police are expected to control the public to keep them in in place. And as soon as you bring that control element in, you're discussing sort of those ideas of like masculinity and and other issues that we have of control and, and patriarchy and, and you know systemic um, power. Mm. It's interesting though because like we're talking about hero cops or what define what kind of makes a cop a hero within a film because you could go basically one of two ways you've got the one who will be by the law do it by the book and actually get the job done following the rules yeah. then you got like dirty harry he, he does follow the law but he does it in his way yeah. where it's like okay i'll overstep the mark but i got the criminal so does that make him a hero like that's that that's the interesting thing i think those particular films they're trying to show to you that sometimes you have to go beyond the system because the system won't work and I think that's kind of how you define those hero cops in that way, the ones who still serve and do the right thing, even if it means going beyond it. I think uh, Serpico is a good example of that as well, mm. of a guy who genuinely wanted to make changes, but the system was so fucked inside that he had no, no chance from the start. Yeah, it worked against him. You see, like my my perspective quite often on on the idea of hero cop films is that they can't really be heroes because of <laughs> various reasons. You know, the system itself, but also the idea that you know taking the law into their own hands and and doing something to uh, outside of that system um, often leads to you know in reality, not necessarily in films, but like the perception that police are above the law and able to do anything and should be able to do anything in order to catch the yeah, criminal. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I just tend to shy away from that stuff. I don't like it. It's a hard bomb with heroes. Like I'm, I'm thinking of Fargo right now. Like She is a hero cop. And Fargo is a unique cop movie. One, it's set in a very small area of Fargo and it's like snowy and all that kind of stuff. But she's just a very regular person. She's pregnant and she's just trying to get to each bit of the information. Whereas her whole, you know, like patriarchy around her are kind of like, they, they respect her, but they're not like, well, you know, you look after the kid, don't, don't go further with this. And I think that's the other thing with hero cops is it's always a little element of curiosity killed the cat. How far will you go to get the truth and to get what is right and to do the right thing with all the bigger, more powerful, corrupt things around it? Or... Criminals that are a little bit out of your league in that respect. You see that a lot with the yeah, small league cops, like in small little villages. It's always them against something that's completely out of their... Not just, well, not just jurisdiction, but yeah, depths, you know? So, uh, uh, touching on that, it's kind of like um, Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. Like, I think that's a really good kind of showcase of a cop who's willing to go above and beyond the law, but um, do things that slightly aren't right to sort of find out the truth yeah. and then he does unravel stuff that's a bit bigger than him but and you know it kind of gets counteracted where he loses bads and stuff and and he still pushes to do the right thing what he perceives to be right and um yeah eddie murphy kills that role it's a classic story you know like a, a hero cop who goes beyond what is expected of him it's a beautiful fantasy you just saying uh, doing the right thing just immediately made me think of uh, Spike Lee. Yeah. Um, yeah and yeah. obviously Black Black Klansman yes. is uh, a, 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 probably one of the only examples of a, of a hero cop film that I've, I've truly enjoyed because of the way that he... I mean, he doesn't even bend the rules, really. He just does something that the white police officers around him aren't willing yeah, to do yeah. and aren't, uh, you know, aren't invested in doing. Um, and I think he's like uniquely placed in in um, 
his position in life to be able to, you know, use these horrible obscenities to refer to people, uh, you know, racial slurs and yeah, things yeah. like that quite easily. Whereas the other police officers wouldn't, uh, would feel uncomfortable saying those things, um, despite the fact that they probably, you know, a lot of them are still racist in, in that film. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's, that's probably the best example of a hero cop film I can think of. It's interesting with that film as well because obviously the way it's done, it's got that slight black exploitation vibe, so it's kind of funky and it's a bit like he's a cool guy, even though he's a very regular guy outside of the bigger movement that's happening around him. And you feel like a lot of what he's fighting for is turned on by the bigger movement and not just being a cop and having to fight just you know that position in itself to do the right thing. Um, Keep saying do the right thing. But, well, that's, that's more well, corruption. What, we'll get into yeah. that. <laughs> so, one of the films that probably isn't renowned for being a, a good cop film is The Fugitive. Mm. So anyone who listens to this podcast would know I'm a massive Star Wars fan. So when I was a kid, I got introduced <laughs> to The Fugitive, which stars Harrison Ford, yeah, yeah. Han Solo. So I was like, I'm going to watch this. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just a fantastic film because it's it basically does... Where the system does him wrong and wrongly puts him in prison for the murder of his wife, the cop then that's chasing him, which is Tommy Lee Jones, um, fundamentally is doing everything by the book to bring him in. But because the system has let Harrison Ford down, it's effectively let Tommy Lee Jones down as well. So he's doing everything that he yeah. needs to do, but he's still a good cop. And like it, it, like he comes full circle by the end of it and he then starts to realise and put everything together that it wasn't Harrison Ford that killed his wife. Um, and that, that is just another way of looking at it. It's like that guy's doing his duty, but it can sometimes still be wrong, even though in his eyes he's doing right. Well, good example of that. A bit of a weird one when it comes to good cops is Seven. Yeah. They're good cops. They're not bad people. They're just trying to get to the, the case. But they're pushed to their limit. Yeah, because they've got something a lot more evil and clever manipulating the whole situation. It kind of plays in, I know I mentioned it earlier in the industry, but with, with um, Hannibal Lecter, the cops are always completely good people who want to do the right thing. But the way he pushes them, pushes them, he pushes them to the point where they're either going to incite violence or be put to the full fear point. Silent Lamb's a good example. She, she's doing everything she can to try and catch the other killer by getting in touch with Hannibal Lecter. And it just gets her more and more into that psyche. And again, it goes to curiosity, killed the cat kind of thing. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because, like, in, in all of these, um, you know, good cop, hero cop kind of films, yeah. um, there's always that element of corruption still in there of, you know, are they doing uh, truly the right thing, whether they're playing by the book or outside of the book? It, you know, there, there's always that moral ambiguity, that moral line. I think it's really important to make a, a police film feel uh, like it's doing a bit more than just glorifying the, the police. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's an exploration of, of that sort of element of power and whether that is a positive or a negative and, and how that can have an impact. I think a great film that sort of showcases that is Heat, 1995, because effectively um, you've got Robert um, De Niro, who is the criminal, and you've got Al Pacino, who is the, the cop, but they're effectively the same sort of character. They're very mm. similar. They're just in different... Like, Worlds, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, they have a fantastic scene in a cafe. And they're effectively saying that to each other. That, oh, well, you know, I'm good at what I do. That's why I do it. I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, but it just showcases that, part, like, that mirroring of what defines a good cop. Because he is a good cop. Mm. Like, but then... like. Robert Downey Jr. is a good criminal. So you're yeah. looking at both of them and you're thinking, well, these both guys I'm rooting for here and they're, they're about to come face to face and yeah, yeah. one of them's going to lose. Like, I think it's interesting because it does lead into nicely into our second point with uh, corruption. Because you're right, it is a question of who's got the power and what do you do with that power of being uh, a person of authority, essentially. I'm, I'm a massive fan for a downward spiral, so police corruption is totally my jam. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather watch that than watch a hero cop any day. And um, I, I watched Bad Lieutenant last night. Bad Lieutenant's a really interesting example of these sort of films. Firstly, there's the original by Abel Ferreira, and then there's a call of Werner Herzog's one with Nick Cage. The first film stars Harvey Keitel. And essentially, he's so fucking morally repugnant and so corrupt that he knows it himself. 
but not in the sense where he's happy about it. He's like hiring prostitutes, drinking vodka all the time. He can't do a good action in himself. He'll get whatever he wants with his power move, like he masturbates in front of these young girls because he knows he can, because he's pulled them up in the car and going, is this your car, blah, 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 you're too young to be driving this car. So he knows he can put him in that position. He takes, um, he takes that aggression towards minorities as well. But by the end of it, he's like, crying and screaming and you can feel his anguish if he doesn't want to be this person. I think that's a really interesting idea with that. I mean, Werner Herzog does a similar thing with the Nick Cage film, but it's more for a wild ride kind of thing. So in corruption, you can either be with him and be on the enjoyable ride of the corruption, or you're seeing that sort of breakdown of what it is to be a, a human, a good person. And corruption is always an interesting way to see that. You went in quite heavy on the corrupt cops <laughs> level, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, you went in 10. <laughs> um, but, well, talking of that, like a, a great film that showcases corrupt cops, but the way that they're perceived and seen um, as the character would be The Departed. Yeah, yeah. You have De Niro, uh, De Niro, DiCaprio, who plays like the infiltrator, who's the good guy, but... His character comes across as the bad guy and he might fall in to that corruption. Whereas you've got um, Matt Damon, <laughs> <laughs> um, who basically is the perceived as the good guy. Like, always does stuff on time, like really good at his job. But he's actually the one that's, you know, infiltrated the police and given off information to the mob boss. Um, and then you could argue Mark Wahlberg's character as well. He gives off this real vile, hostile kind of um, character, but he's actually good and the way that it resolves itself in the end. I think The Departed is a great film for having loads of different intertwining themes of what is good, what is bad. <clears throat> well, that's the thing, the, the morality in that film yo-yos. Mm. It's not a downward spiral, it's about seeing the, you know, th th that... But you can see the corruption factor in Matt Damon's character. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. how far he's willing to go to make sure that he gets the rat and... Um, because he tries to take on the case and stuff, doesn't he? Um, yeah, I just think that's really interesting. And the thing with films as well in particular, and it's something that we can't always offer in real life, is that if you have a corrupted story, it doesn't even matter if they're going to find some sort of salvation. They're going to have a bad ending, you know? They're going to be killed or they're going to go to prison. It's, you can't allow them to just get away with it and the story doesn't end in that way. It just... I think because there's so much corruption in the world, it, it just makes you a bit like, mm, that doesn't seem right, we need to do it. Well, not, not doesn't seem right, but we want to see that fancy idea of, well, they didn't get away with it. Yeah, yeah. And obviously in reality, that's not, that's no. not the case. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, so a film that springs to mind, that kind of blurs the lines a little bit, and actually two films, but um, Angel Heart, so I think it's a 1991 film with Mickey Rourke, so it's a cop who's investigating all these murders, but he's always one step behind. And he's perceived as the good guy. You follow him the whole way through and you're like, oh, well, hopefully he gets, you know, due diligence and um, finds out who this murderer is. And the big twist in it is basically he's the murderer. Um, <clears throat> so he's like got split personality. So it completely flips it on its head. And you're like, well, hold on. He's, he's corrupt then, isn't he? He's like massively bad and... It's just really interesting how that, in that case, it blurs lines. And another one would be Shutter Island. With the corruption as well, it's obviously a power struggle. And unfortunately, um, this comes down to a lot of race. There's a film in particular, it's a short film within the anthology of Tales of the Hood. And it's basically uh, like this new black cop is with these white cops and they're just going on the, you know, the stretch, doing the usual thing. And they stop this... Um, richer black guy who's clearly running in politics and they beat him to death and kill him. The ghost comes back through some voodoo and tortures those cops for them to recognise what they've done wrong. And I think, yeah, unfortunately in our world, we can't not talk about police corruption without racism. Yeah. They almost go hand in hand. And it is that power thing because those people in those communities, they're there to believe that these people are there to help them. And these characters, you get a lot of them. And is it actually quite a trend you get like these antagonistic racist cop movies? There are loads of them. Even if there's only like a small proportion of it in a film, like Boys in the Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Boys in the Hood does it in a really interesting way because it's the black cop mm. who's really re aggressively reacting to them because of the image that the police force in itself has built of who black people were in the early 90s. And that's the biggest problem with, with these, you know, g getting away from films, but cops in general, is that you've built a, s a system where people will turn against the, their own communities because they think it's the right thing to do because it's the, the system. Well, I mean, again, outside of films, you know why the cops, the police force in America was actually started in the, uh, in the beginning was because of uh, capturing slaves mm. who'd escaped. Uh, so I think that, you know, that it's, it is intrinsic within in police. Like, it is part of the institution that the the racism will exist. Yeah, it's, it's woven in the DNA. And I think the same goes for the corruption. It's woven into the DNA simply because to have power over someone else is in itself a corruption. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so, like, you can't not have police corruption uh, just like you can't not have police racism. It's, it's, it's a complicated... Um, it's a very complicated subject, but that was going way off. Oh. <laughs> Again, <laughs> go, <a> thought. <laughs> go about Spike Lee, and finally, do the right thing. Yeah, the police are such an interesting force in that because the first time you see the police is when they've released all the the, um, the watering, so they can just get wet because it's it's fucking boiling. And then the police turn up, instantly shut it down, throw so much aggression that the whole community almost comes together to experience this aggression from the police. And of course, later on during the riot. Well, they, they instigate the riot by killing um, Radio, Radio ha Hahim. And I don't know, it's like, it's such a punch in the face in the film because it's so, it's like great music, everyone's having a good time, it's hard, the whole community's together, you're really getting that vibe. And the police just shut any of that down immediately, repressing it all. Yeah, and I think I, the, the thing that I found really interesting about a moment in the film where the riot literally sparks because of the way that the police come in yeah, yeah. Um, is that uh, the reason uh, the police force in general was come up with in, in the, the, you know, um, it was actually in Ireland, um, was to Ooh. stop uprisings and to yeah. stop riots. And so seeing that uh, the way that the the police actually caused that riot, you kind of go, well, you've made yourselves redundant here. You're no longer fulfilling the sort of like very, very basic origin of, of, the, uh, of the job that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that is, you know, down to the racism and the attitudes towards sort of uh, people, poorer people, particularly poorer black people in America. What, what, what film are you talking about right now? Do the Right Thing. Oh, okay. I was thinking, like, I'm sitting listening and I'm like, Sh the Chicago 7? Isn't that what we watched recently? Mm -hmm. Trial of Chicago <laughs> yeah. 7. Yeah. So it's very similar. It is, but I, I would call that more of a courtroom film than a, yeah. than a police film. It is film. a courtroom, but, it does but what instigates the, it? Yeah, the way that the police are, are um, represented in that film. They just, they essentially um, cause all the problems by trying to stop the, the uh, you know, what they perceive as being a riotous mob. Uh, they turn them into a riotous mob by treating them that way in the first place. And I think that's quite an interesting mm. way of like, looking at it. Mm. I think, unfortunately, because for a long time Hollywood has been, you know, glorifying police, glorifying those actions. And we think even like Dirty Harry, all those kind of 70s films, they're all stern, strict men. Even British, like Sweeney and stuff like that. And it was only recently that we, we, we can't really tell that story anymore because it's just not true. Um, going on a TV level, things like Brooklyn 999 and shows like that, they're looking at how they're going to reconfigure their series because of everything that's happened with Black Lives Matter. You can't just show this, hey, we're all fun cops and we're all working together, teamwork and all that, because that's obviously another key element of cops is teamwork. It's sort of um, pulling the rug over it and just yeah. like, you know pretending, oh, it's, it's not there, it's not there, let's pretend quickly. There's a big hole. Every, all the place are so nice. <laughs> you, don't, it's, you don't see that so much with films nowadays, and it's a good thing. It's yeah. a good thing to show both sides. Like, if it's not the corruption, it's the, the, it's the moral corruption of how much it breaks you down as a person, going back to Seven and going back to Bad Lieutenant and stuff like that. You know, It's a hard job, and we need to see that reality as well as the, the corruption it brings. Not only that, I think there's some films out there that show it from a perspective of like someone who is a cop, but they're put in a precarious position because the law is wrong or their their partner's corrupt, yeah, yeah. and they can't do anything so that they effectively support what is going on corruption-wise, mm. but they can't do anything to fix it. Yeah, and that, and that's usually like the the sad ending for a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, 
that kind of leads nicely into the other Does side. Does it of lead? No, I was going to well, say, you know, like we, we don't have they don't have control over that to be a good cop, but then you've always got the other side of the cop, the stupid cop. Yeah, the comedy cop, the naked gun. Yeah, <laughs> Keystone Cops, for for example. They, they, I mean, I've I've never actually watched any of these films, but you know, it's it's a well known phrase meaning a stupid cop because of the um, films from it was between nineteen twelve and nineteen seventeen. Oh, wow. These these films came out, um, Jesus. displaying uh, cops as being incompetent idiots, basically. But it's still we go we we talk about a lot about the foundations of the the original characters that led cinema. And it's interesting to see Stupid Cops are one of them. You see all the time, like, animated TV shows with, like, Simpsons and South Park. That's one of their first archetypal characters, the Stupid Cop. Mm. And I think it's a way to be able to, to soften some of those corruption elements with, with those sort of characters. A yeah. good example, Hot Fuzz. Yeah. Hot Fuzz <laughs> likes to play both roles, because you've got the, the Stupid Cop in um, Nick Frost's character, who's just an idiot. And almost in there from a bit of nepotism. From well, and, and he also he also wants to be the hero. He wants yeah. to be yeah, the yeah, badass yeah. hero, shooting his gun into the air, kind of thing. It's always and, the glorified Hollywood hero of it, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, Simon Pegg's character, it's very serious. Is, yeah, and and is is very by the book and very sharp and strict. Um, Until the end, when and, he's not really by the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, he has to to, to, to get the. You know, get the bad guys. He has to go against the book, which, of course, in that film is because the book is also associated with a cult that are running the village. You know, a bit complicated. Yeah, though. yeah. The police, the police force itself is, is so corrupt that yeah, he yeah. cannot operate within the system in order to, you know, change it or bring it down. So which, he has to go outside of the system. Which with, is the beauty of the irony of the fact that the beginning of the film he leaves the big town because it's like, ah, oh, you're too, you're too crazy. Go and do go, go to this small <laughs> little village. Great film. When you were saying about Naked Gun, Naked Gun's an interesting one because it plays with the absurdism of every little element of what it is to be a detective or trying to put the puzzle pieces together, you know? And I think you can have a lot of fun with that. He stumble bums his way through it. Most yeah, because yeah, he accidentally but, finds but it. He? I think it was probably one of the, especially like in the sort of well, late 70s, 80s and stuff, because it was Police Squad before, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, they just play with the absurdism, like very, very simple things. One of my favourite sketches of it is um, someone offers him a cigarette. It's like, a cigarette? And I was like, yes, it is. It's just the simple <laughs> things like that. And, and like every single time the running joke where he pulls up outside somewhere and he just hits a trash can or hits something. It's like the, the absurdism of, with it. But you're rooting for him the whole well, time. I, I think what makes that funny, though, is the way that he says Leslie things Nielsen. with, with yeah. such authority. And um, conviction. You know, yeah, and like like he is, he believes that he is the most intelligent person in the room. And that's something that you often get with like in, in real life with police-type yeah. people. Where if you've ever been talked to by police or asked questions, they always treat you like you're an idiot. That they and they are in somehow no no better or no more, um, and quite often by doing that expose their own stupidity, which is, is something that's wonderful to see in film. But I think as well within that you've got um, the idea of self awareness because of that police sometimes aren't self aware, and that's what Leslie Nielsen's character does in the Nick yeah. Gun so well is that like even throughout all of his absurdism he still just like <laughs> doesn't know what's going on. It all ties in nicely because we know as an audience what to expect from a crime film or a cop film or a police film or anything like that. So when you bring it into a comedy sense, you're just finding ways to parody your expectations of it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, Naked Gun and Hot Fuzz are probably the most successful Pink police Panther. comedies. Pink Panther's a good example. Yeah, it's <laughs> detective, mm. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, again, uh, he is he he does that same thing of like saying things with such conviction, always believing that he is the most intelligent person in the room and... And it, it leads to him being incredibly stupid. <laughs> but he gets results, god damn it. <laughs> you almost fucked that yeah, one I up, did, didn't yeah. you? <laughs> Stumbled. It was part of the... I was playing a character. Oh, okay. It was part of it, okay. yeah. <laughs> I took on the role of a cop. <laughs> See, I, I think one of the funniest um, sort of portrayals of, you know, stupid cops that think they're serious is Pineapple Express. Like yeah. the cops hunting them down and everything, like they take themselves super serious, like the yeah. woman character and everything. But they just stumble bum their way through it. Um, it's interesting you say that because I was just I was trying to think of um, other funny cops, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've seen uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherit Vice, jo uh, what's his face? Um, Josh Brolin plays a cop in that, and he's so conservative, like Nixon esque. 
there's an element of absurdism because he's so over the top with his rigidness and hatred for hippies. And it makes it incredibly funny to see someone who's the other side of that, not necessarily um, authoritative know-how, but more just like, this is the book and this is how you're going to be and you're the, you're the opposite of everything I am. But in that film, he's consistently on the private detective's back constantly. You're like, why are you still bothering with him? And it's almost like he just enjoys that little position of power. There's a brilliant scene where um, Joaquin Phoenix, who plays the detective, is eating some mushrooms. And um, Josh Brolin just storms into the house, takes the mushrooms, eats, eats them all, and walks off. <laughs> and it says so much about the authority that he thinks he's got in that position because he's a private detective and he's an actual figure of authority in that regard. And I think it, it's really interesting to see just how ridiculous that can be. And Josh Brolin's so committed to being like that conservative kind of cop that yeah, it works quite nicely. See, I would say 21 Jump Street. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. another good example. And 22 Jump Street. Yeah. I'm Jeff. Those films are weird because they're very funny and they're very good. The character's great, direction's great, but it actually gives a really positive image of what cops are, really. Mm. It doesn't play on the negative. It plays on them being idiots, but their intentions are good and they're not really, they have no corruption within them. They're just mm. children, if anything. So it's almost like their children ideology of what a cop's supposed to be. Yeah, it's the naivety that yeah. they play off, isn't it? And I think that's, with the films, is you know, partly because of the series originally being, you know, um, younger, uh, younger yeah, cast, yeah, yeah. wasn't it? But, um, yeah, it's interesting, because obviously uh, with them, they, they accidentally uh, un uncover other undercover yeah, cops yeah. Uh, on the, on <laughs> the job whole... that they're doing, <laughs> and they end up getting shot. And it, I mean, it's brilliant because the, the belief is that they are the only police in the situation, and, and you know, they don't fully sort of comprehend how many different departments might be operating within this yeah, thing. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's quite an interesting thing to, to, you know, in a comedy to do because it's looking at the way that competing departments will, um, you know, essentially. Uh, fuck each other over uh, for lack of a better word yeah. <laughs> um, funny you say that because the other guys it's yes, pretty yes, much yeah, like yeah, that yeah. <clears throat> and so you've got the pretty stern cops that you know get results get the job done and Samuel L. Jackson and um, <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson and um, you kind of the whole way that the film goes it completely subverts you at the start because they think they're invincible they get results that they just jump off a building <laughs> it's like when I first watched that, I think I went to the cinema and watched it. I was like, oh, right, but they're, they're not dead. That was a dream or something, wasn't it? Yeah. It's like, and and then straight you, to the funeral. Yeah. Very clear so, to the audience. Whoa, okay. <laughs> this is the way we're going. And I, like at the time, I was there was loads of films coming out with Will Ferrell and stuff. He was massive. And him partnered with Mark Wahlberg. I think that's the first time they yeah. were actually partnered. They contrast each other so well. <laughs> like You've got the nerdy sort of paperwork guy and Will Ferrell. You've got the... The Mark Wahlberg who wants to be the successful, rugged cop that gets the results, but he's just a bit shit. And I, I and love, I love the, uh, you know, that that idea of them jumping off the building, um, simply because of the, you know, it's playing, it's taking that to its absolute limit, that yeah, arrogance yeah. of like. I am beyond the law to the point that they think that they're beyond the law of gravity, <laughs> yeah. you know? um, which is it's just a brilliant, brilliant setup for a film, isn't it? Again, like Twenty Two Jump Street, it doesn't show a negative light to the police, but it does show the, the hypocrisy well, and stupidity of it. I don't know because I feel like the way that they hero worship those two characters at the beginning, mm, who cause true. massive amounts of devastation, yeah. destroy <laughs> loads of buildings, <laughs> and I think they mention this in in the film in like a small part of it, yeah, yeah, where yeah. it shows that the cost of of being a hero actually is more villainous than the than the <laughs> crime that they've uncovered and and stopped. It's all right. They just put taxes up. That's, <laughs> See, that's a really interesting question I think that's something that cop films should explore is that yeah is the cost of being a hero going to turn you into the, the villain Yeah. and so many cop films sounds like a always, Batman quote <laughs> well again like you know that is a general thing with crime and obviously Batman plays nicely into that but with crime in general it is always that thing of how far do you go being on the side you know you're supposed to be there to take down the crime but if you're always on that line how quickly can you just jump into that line and cop films always explore that in quite an interesting way. Thanks for listening, guys. As ever, please leave a like if you enjoyed the content today. And um, 
Also, leave a comment with any cop films that you like or we might have missed, and subscribe as ever, and ring the bell to be notified for everything trash arts. We've got videos and uh, music videos, film trailers, things like that coming out over the next few weeks and months. And uh, please check out our website, www.trasharts.co.uk. Other than that, guys, thanks for listening. Trash Arts, take out. Shut up.